Hi everybody and welcome to the 38th edition of Uppsala International Short Film Festival and uh, the seminar series uh, Uppsala Talks. Uh, the seminar uh, that we're going to uh, be in now uh, is a collaboration with Filmrummet and it's called Minorities on Screen, Telling Your Own Story. Uh, and uh, yeah, my name is Sigrid Hadinus and I work here as the festival producer and also I'm in charge of the seminar series. This is why I'm stealing the spotlight a bit. But I would like now to uh, leave over the microphone for our, to our moderator for the hour, uh, Lina Pöhne. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Uh, it's nice that you are so many people here. Uh, we will have a one hour discussion uh, here today, and we will mostly speak in English. But before we start, and I introduce Adam and Anna, I, Malin from the Film Institute will speak a little bit in Swedish about a project they are launching. So, okay. Is it okay in Swedish, or someone wants me to speak in English? Okej, jag fortsätter på svenska. Jag ville bara innan vi börjar berätta att Svenska Filminstitutet sedan två år ungefär har ett speciellt uppdrag kring nationella minoriteter. All information om vad vi gör och en strategi som vi har tagit fram för att lyfta film på minoritetsspråken i Sverige finns under en webbsida som heter filminstitutet.se-nationella-minoriteter. Och jag är samordnare för det här projektet och bland annat så har vi en kortfilmsutlysning som är deadline på måndag, så det är hurry up om det är någon som är intresserad av att vara med, eh, som handlar om kortfilm på minoritetsspråken. För något vi vet det är att vi sällan ser skildringar och där våra nationella minoritetsspråk i Sverige eh, finns med i skildringarna. Så vi är nyfikna på vem som vill berätta de här historierna eh, och med de här perspektiven. Så vet vi också att det finns människor i Sverige som tillhör de nationella minoriteterna som inte alls har tillgång till sina språk om man kan sin historia. Så har vi till och med förbjudit människor i Sverige att prata sina språk. Därför har vi sagt att vårt uppdrag handlar om språken och att vi ska rädda språken. Men vi har sagt att de här projekten ska vara helt eller delvis på ett minoritetsspråk. Vi pratar alltså finska, jiddisch, romani, samiska och mehenkeli. Det är våra nationella minoritetsspråk i Sverige. Så gå in och läs. Filminstitutet.se i glod. Det här projektet heter Glöd om ni vill ta del av det. Annars finns det mer information. Så är ni nyfikna och har ni tankar kring detta uppdrag så får ni också jättevälkomna och ta kontakt med mig och prata om det. Jag sitter här under hela seminariet och efter. Okej, okay, Lina. Yes. Um, so the theme of this one hour discussion uh, will be minorities and in the indigenous people and the representation of them, of us, in mostly film. Um, and we will discuss how historical portraits and representation of minorities affect and live with us today, and also talk about the need of um, stories from within, from within the minorities. And also there is a strong process going on of where many different minorities want to reclaim their right to tell their own stories and we have two examples of people that have been working quite long in different ways in this scene. Um, and we will both speak about ethnical mi minorities but also a little bit touch uh, sexual minorities and queer questions later. Um, so, um, now I'll get to introduce Adam and Anna. Uh, so I will introduce you briefly and then we'll get to know them more soon. And Anna Linde, you're a curator, filmmaker with roots in Lapland. And um, Anna has worked in many different forms, moving in images, film, sound, installation. And Anna is the artistic leader of Sakni, which is a um, Swedish archive for queer moving images. And both queer themes, but also themes concerning the Sami uh, community have been present in some of the work. Um, and 
then we have a guest all the way from North America, and I guess that's what so many people came. <laughs> uh, Adam Khalil, uh, you're an artist and a filmmaker, and um, also like Anna, you've been working with many medias, performance, installation, documentaries, video games, and sculpture. And you have roots in the Objiwe tribe in Northern America. And Adam has curated a program for this festival that will be shown tomorrow that is called uh, Anti-Ethnography. So if you're here still tomorrow, and this seminar gives you lust to see more, um, you can watch that. Um, so my name is Lina and I work um, mostly with um, the Finnish minority in Sweden in television and as a journalist. Um, so, I'm going to start with asking you, Adam, um, at what point in your life uh, did you start, in a more conscious way, think about your heritage and how it later became a part of the projects you make? First, thanks for having me, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, I saw Nick work with my brother, who's not here, but I just want to... Zach, we make stuff together. Um, me and my brother moved back to our reservation in northern Michigan when I was like 12 years old. And we grew up in cities before then, so it was kind of a real crash course within our culture upon returning there. And then we started to make work together like in our late teens. And then our mother, who was like a really important person to our community, was like running the education department for our tribe. So our house was this really kind of crazy place where everyone kind of came through. And it was a lot of like sitting and talking and listening. And that was really like our education for our culture, was that kind of drop-in zone vibe. Uh, and our mother passed away about seven years ago, and she was working on a PhD dissertation, kind of situating indigenous knowledge and epistemologies away from museums and back towards communities. And she wasn't able to finish the dissertation, so me and my brother kind of took it upon ourselves to finish that work in a film that we made, which will be like an excerpt of here. Uh, so that was kind of like the, the start of the artistic engagement with that part of it. And has it become um, a big part of, of your artistic work? Yes and no, because we're also trying to avoid being kind of pigeonholed in a certain way. So like, I made another feature film with a friend that has the same kind of themes of like, settler colonialism and resistance but doesn't kind of perform nativeness in a traditional way. And we're, kind of, we're constantly trying to like figure out ways to outmaneuver being labeled or stuck in one position. So that way the work could be considered on its own merit as opposed to like kind of dismissed or put aside as like this thing and not that thing. Uh, Anna, um, as I said before, you've addressed both um, questions of uh, uh, queer questions and Sami questions in your work, but could you tell a little bit about your relationship to the Sami community? Um, yes, from the beginning it's more uh, interest in families, because I have Sami on three sides in my family, but we have never lived in the Sami culture uh, in that way, but the Sami people were always uh, uh, what do you say, family friends uh, in generations. So um, my grandparents, uh, both sides, um, hosted fam families when they were traveling and moved with the reindeers. Uh, so I have, you know, been in that kind of house all my life. And my grandpa was always talking very friendly about Samis. As you know, in this period, is. Uh, I'm born 67 and um, I grew up in a racist uh, time for Sami people. So in my hometown studio, man, they talked a lot of bad uh, stuff about Sami people all the time. But in my family, we were very positive uh, and we have a lot of Sami friends. Um, so I think that's why I'm kind of 
friendly also to 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 my my grandparents how I I learned this culture somehow even if we didn't live it ourselves but I could see it close and I started to research my own Sami background and looked on Sami questions through works in my art practice. Um, so I think it's like, and I can I can vote in Sami Tinget, for example. So I, I, even if I'm not living it, I, I try to be aware of what what I can do and what I can be in this community. Um, so throughout history, the uh, the public stories of minorities have been um, often told by others than the minorities themselves. And uh, these portraits, of course, have taken many forms, but many times also have been filled with stereotypes. And I would want to ask, um, how do you feel that affects you today? And do you have any uh, uh, certain examples of uh, a memory of seeing a film or something that have the, you have kind of strong memories of reacting. Adam? Sure. Uh, there's an American movie called Smoke Signals, which was actually one of like the first like narrative films that was authored by an indigenous person about North American indigenous culture. And I remember seeing that when I was like 14, being like, whoa. <laughs> to be able to relate to like a Hollywood looking movie in that way. And now 20 odd years later the film is problematic in all kinds of ways because so many other native voices have been allowed to kind of take up that space of imagination of narrative filmmaking, which is amazing. Uh, but that was like one of the first moments where I was like, oh, these stories could be told in this way. But then another thing me and my brother were constantly thinking about in terms of authoring films about our own community is the history of documentary and Native American people. It's like one of their first recorded images ever made is Thomas Edison's Sue Ghost Dance. So it was one of the first cameras. And he invited this acting troupe called Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, which was people kind of like performing different Native rituals, but like almost in a theater or circus vibe. Uh, and they're performing this like sacred Lakota dance. Most of the people are Native, but they're not Lakota. So they're kind of faking it which we always thought was kind of funny because documentary has this proximity to truth, but from its inception has always been kind of a fabrication or propaganda. And then thinking about how one of the biggest problems with our community is we're not allowed to be contemporary, mm. because if we're, not con if we're not authentic, then the only way to be authentic is to like exist in a past that doesn't exist anymore. So that's why we thought that film was like a really relevant forum to try to author contemporary Native stories. Uh, or like Nanook of the North, which people consider like one of the first documentaries, mm -hmm. is actually like the way that it was constructed is much more similar to a narrative film, where they were like rehearsing and setting up shots and kind of again like performing this desire for what people wanted natives to be, as opposed to actually documenting a culture that existed in the present moment. And it goes back to these cliches about like the vanishing Indian and trying to document something before it disappears, as opposed to allowing something like, if a culture is not allowed to adapt, how the hell would it continue on? Uh, and that's like, there's always this double bind, especially with native cinema that I'm familiar with, of like having to perform this kind of authenticity as opposed to like authentically being contemporary and present in that mode. Yeah, now I remember Väg uh, Visaren. I don't remember the name now of the director, but the Norwegian. One that had a huge impact on me in, in that period. Um, and also, at that period, I was, uh, um, what do you say, I had management for the cinema in Storhuman, so I somehow talked me through a premiere of Fjellets Son, uh, a documentary, also a Norwegian one, um, that made impact also really strong. Uh, and I, I remember I was trying to get the premiere to Tärnaby, Tärnaby Folketshus, because I thought it was better than Storuman, because Tärnaby had more of the, the active Sami people. And it was such an amazing premiere. And it was a premiere 
you know, Folkets bios premier up in Tärnaby. <laughs> it was also funny that uh, this um, distributor allowed me to do it. I don't know how it happened really, but uh, I remember all these people coming in their <laughs> wonderful, you know, I don't know, it was huge families coming with all the dresses and they were so happy. And this was maybe 93 or 94 or something. So, um, and I don't think, because then I didn't use curator as a name because it was not anything you said, it was more a programmer or whatever. And of course I choose that film because of my interest in the Sami questions. Um, was that film like told from uh, in what perspective? From a Sami. It's also well known around Sami people in Sweden. Okay. So if you ask someone, they they like that film as far as I know. But then I don't know so many. It's a huge gap. I and mean, in Sweden, it's not many Sami films at mm. all. So when Sami blood came around, I was so happy because it's also from the south. It's from the area. It's also made in Tarnaby, you know. Mm. So it's where I come from somehow, the, at least the, the, the closest mountains in my hometown. Um, and that film made me cry a lot. Mm. So, Have you heard about Sami blood, some of you? Yeah, if, if they're international guests. It's a movie that came a few years ago about two sisters and the other one kind of longing to leave the community and the other one staying. That has got very famous and touched a lot of people both in... And it's the first big uh, film addressing some issues in Sweden, I would say. Um, I thought we would watch a little clip from um, a project that Anna has... Are you working on in it now or...? I call it ongoing. Ongoing. Slowly ongoing. <laughs> um, and it's called I Samernas Rike. But first, before we start, Anna just wanted to say something about it. Um, yeah, it started like an interest in, in um, political issues around Sami people and how you find all these texts in different medias about Sami people. And uh, it's made, the first piece was made 2007 and it was a small postcard piece uh, where I kind of play with this exotic and tourist image of Sami people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can send it around um, later so you can watch. Um, so at the same time that was made, it was a huge uh, exhibition, I think, at the Nordic Museum. And they also tried with all this. It's it's not easy to move in this, uh, what do you say, uh, how to be both political and also do the right thing. And I'm not a Sami person myself, but this is at least a try to, to show what's written about Sami people from, you know, a long time ago, like in Nordisk family book, really racist texts about Sami people and up to date. And I think uh, right before we we printed it, it was a text in Rocky, yeah, this um, animation, like the, the Comic. cartoons, comics, yes. comics, yeah, really racist also on Sami people. So it's it's popping up all all over in different ways. So and but at that time it was not a discussion. In, in, at least in Sweden, no discussion about Sami art or Sami films or whatever. So I think it was kind of hard because it felt like it's total silence. Um, some some Sami people picked it up and and, and did things with it. And so it was, it's these yeah. uh, little. These are little kind of images with texts behind. The images are. Um, from the north and really sweet, but the texts behind are not that sweet. I will send it around now so you can watch yeah. it. So it plays a little bit with the image of the Sami and how the Swedish uh, kind of tourism and uh, state and uh, use the Sami people to sell out things like it's postcards, it's classical postcards, but they are staged at Skansen and you know, all these places. Um, and it was a the most the, the, the most difficult work was uh, to find out the rights for using the postcards. 
because it's commercial. <laughs> so, so how does that link to the um, piece we're gonna see now? Yeah, it's uh, about the Sami dolls, so it's also a little bit the same. Mm. And it's still, um, uh, you know, if you go to an airport in the Nordic countries, you can buy a Sami doll. So it's still ongoing, but the Sami people have a different uh, yeah, thoughts of it, because it's also about identification. So a lot of Sami people have you know, made their own Sami dolls with the, the clothes, but the, of course the, the right clothes, but the mass productions is not with the right clothes, it's just a <laughs> tourist thing. But they have, yeah, so this is a... This is a piece, an installation, um, where four Sami people talk about the Sami dolls and they didn't know them before, so I had them in a, in a bag. And uh, we start with an empty table and the film is, um, the shot is from above, so the thing is to see their hands, not the faces, and you hear the voices, so the installation is on the table, so I haven't seen it projected like this before, but it's on the table so you can walk around it and then you hear the voices talking about the Sami dolls and they discuss the, the, the different uh, dolls and what, what the dresses looks like. This is a typical for tourism. Turistdockor som säljs för turister, så man kan ju inte säga exakt eh, vilken dräkt det är, men det liknar ju eh, kanske f, eh, ja, i, i, i mera finsk, norra Finland, mer än Kautokeino. Och sen, de har ju inte spets på sina mössor, här är, finns ju spets med, så det är... Det är men jag tänker vajsa samerna har ju spets. Jo, men de är ju karisvandra samer. Jo, jo, jo. Men det där är ju heller inte någon karisvandra direkt, utan nej. det är också en för att oh. säljas. Och samma här. För turister. Men jag tänkte säga att det här. känns alltid som att det, som att det är uh, nordsamer. Alltså ja. jag tycker väldigt ofta att när, när det ska vara direkt, ja, då det ska det gärna något. vara den här tofsen. Ja. Och så ska det gärna vara liksom mycket och då är det så här en sjal för tjejerna. Och... Torsen tillhör ju då karisvandodräkten. Men den här mössan kan man ju säga är en karisvandomössa. Men dräkten här, det är ju inte någon, något som jag som kommer från karisvandområdet kan identifiera. Inte färgerna är väl också de samiska färgerna. Men... Men, det men man också... kan väl säga att mansmössan ändå, den finns ju, Nej, även det om det är jag. turistgrej, så att den ja, är i alla fall gäller var det, mm. ja, det... det samemännen de hade. Ja, men det är samma som jag ja. sa, att det här ja. är ju från, från Finland, men att det är ju inga traditionella dräkter, om jag säger så. Alltså jag undrar om man inte sa men om man förstår att det här är en kille. Det förstår man säkert <laughs> inte. <laughs> Hur kan man se att det är en kille? Ja, precis. För att det, det känns lite som att det, det blir en klänning och så blir de här ja. långa ögonfransarna. Ja. Men man kanske inte bryr sig. Really interesting uh, discussions. Um, just by listening to a few sentences you really realize how much specific knowledge there is to this. Uh, and I think it's 50 dolls. It's a i had collected them for I don't know ten years or something, so it's quite a lot. So in the end, it's a table full of these dolls, and it's no not one from the from the south, not one doll from the south. And how do you know who produces these dolls? Uh, yeah, I tried to get contact with them, but it was impossible. Uh, so I just left it for a while. I don't know. Uh, it's uh, it's still ongoing, especially in Finland. Does this, uh, what do you think when you saw this? You didn't hear the conversation or no, it's super funny because there's the same dolls for like our tribe. That's sell them <laughs> in the same town to tourists. They're totally like inaccurate and bizarre and made in China. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's something that's really cool about this conversation too is thinking about indigenous issues on a global scale. So it's not something that only exists in certain parts of the world and the similarities between similar situations around settler colonialism, mm -hmm. like residential schools or boarding schools and 
commodification of culture and the desire to put our cultures in the past, in an accessible past. It's bizarre. It's pretty sci-fi. <laughs> But uh, speaking about that, uh, about the past and the present, um, do you feel that in from within the community are there? Because of course, in the communities, they are sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller. But there's a vast difference of people, in, of course, and um, who gets to represent the minority is not always an easy question either. And also. In some cases, um, there are movements within the minority that also kind of wanna um, wanna control what 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 can we tell about our minority because it can become very personal. And that thing you said about that about the word contemporary, I think it's a question that many minorities face with like different forces, with an older generation with a certain view and sometimes a more conservative view. And have you experienced that kind of clash between both groups and generations within these? You had one example, Anna, that you told me I was thinking about when you cur curated this program. You want to share a little bit of it? or? Uh, yes, uh, I was invited for Samiska Veckan i Umeå um, as a curator to uh, yeah, do some programs. And my proposal was uh, two programs with short films. And I ended up with three programs, I think. And um, I wanted to have the freedom as a curator to choose, of course. But it was a lot of under table things going on, the, the wishes of what I should curate. Uh, and I didn't follow it. Um, so I, I, I tried to do my, my thing and uh, I showed uh, both a film about alcoholism and uh, also I looked for queer Sami films. So I mixed all of that and also I showed films from people looking on the Sami culture uh, from the outside. And all of this is uh, things that I had a feeling that I shouldn't do um, somehow. And I think it was easier when the program then was picked up from Tempo, a documentary <coughs> film festival in Stockholm, and Tempo chose to show it at the Modern Museum. So then it was set in a, a more kind of contemporary art context and it was not a problem at all but up up in the Sami community or in the in the surrounding of that I had a feeling it was so silent uh, so when it was screen it was like <laughs> silence <laughs> uh, uh, yeah so that was hard uh, in that way and um, but I think it's important to to to, to try to find uh, different ways to show the, the culture, both from the inside and from the outside, so. and both historically and kind of contemporary. So, so Adam, we will soon now watch um, a piece of two works that you have done. It's one work. What, this looks like a trailer ah. that's a minute and then an excerpt that's ah, like okay. two and a half minutes. Okay. Do you want to say something before we start or after? Yeah, but just set it up slightly. But yeah, it's a, the first film me and my brother finished. It's called A Not To Say, which is an Ojibwe word. Uh, that means a movie, uh, really original. But it translates to, it shines a certain way to a certain place it flies and falls. And for us, it had two meanings. One is like, that's how movies function, like especially with film traditionally. So it shines a certain way to a certain place, like the projector to the screen, and it flies, it falls, is like 16 or 35 millimeter flying up on the take-up reel. But for me and my brother, it had a more personal resonance, where it shines a certain way to a certain place, as Bawa Ting or Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, where we're from, and it flies, it falls, is kind of indicative of the chaotic nature in which the film came together. Uh, and yeah, my brother's not here, but we made it together. Yeah. It is from understanding that power comes.
and the power in the ceremony was in understanding what it meant. I saw more than I can tell, and I understood more than I saw. I did not have to remember these things. They remembered themselves all these years. us from the top of the Tower of History, with all the electricity and antennas and surveillance equipment. At the top, nothing in the scientifically measurable world is outside the reach of their gaze. ready and fortunate, a vision will come that will lead and direct you in your life. The seventh prophet that came to the people was said to be different than the other prophets. He had a strange light in his eyes. He said, in the seventh fire, a new people will emerge. They will retrace their old steps to see what was left by the trail. Their steps will lead them to the elders who will tell them what to do on their journey. But many of the elders will have fallen asleep. They will awaken to this new time with nothing to offer. Some of the elders will be silent out of fear. Some of the elders will be silent because no one will ask anything of them. The task of the new people will not be easy. If the new people will remain strong in their quest, there will be a rebirth of the Anishinaabe nation. The sacred fire will again be lit. to say is an adaptation of the Seven Fires Prophecy, which is kind of like our tribe's version of history, and it predates and predicts European contact and settlement. Uh, and the different stages of the Seven Fires Prophecy go from where we were on the East Coast, like near Boston, to migrating to the Great Lakes to like get away from settlement, but eventually it caught up, and it's like around the fourth or the fifth fire. But also, something that was really important for me and my brother to consider, especially after talking with a lot of people who are older than us, is to not be beholden to that iteration of the story, or that iteration of history, and that this idea that history should become a narrative that serves the purpose of contemporary people. So this isn't like the Bible, or like the way that history is normally formulated, or like Benjamin's idea of history is like the angel of history always moving forward and looking back. It's something much more dynamic, and that's allowed to change over time. So we kind of tasked ourselves with this idea of updating the Seven Fires Prophecy for this contemporary moment, which is traditionally what we're supposed to do, even though some traditionalists were like, that's taboo. Uh, and a lot of the artwork and elements in that are either like 
quote unquote prehistoric cave drawings or like uh, this Ojibwe artist from the 60s, Norval Morisot, who was very controversial at the time because he was taking these traditional oral stories and making them into these gigantic psychedelic canvases that actually sold really well. He was known as the Picasso of the North and like ended up hanging out with him. And he's a really interesting figure and kind of considered the first contemporary native artist. Um, so really inspired by the way that he was adapting these things in order to perpetuate them into the future as opposed, and also like he was only able to do that because like laws banning our religion ended around the time where he became prominent. So that was the other reason it was really taboo is because all the stuff was forced and suppressed underground. And then it was finally this moment where it wasn't illegal to be practicing culture, but there was still all the stigma and like understood, like people were afraid, you know what I mean? Because this stuff had to be secret for so long. And this tension of like what we should share and not share based on that history. And also based on the desire people have for the culture. A desire from outside or inside or? Both. I mean, I always tease my uncle because like every time he talks to people visiting, he's like, many moons ago. And I was like, Richard, you don't talk like that. Like, what's going on? So again, it's like people are rewarded for performing a certain identity in a certain way related to authenticity. But like when I talk to him, he's like, yeah, a couple months ago, this guy told me this thing. You know what I mean? I was like, whoa. What? Uh, and I think it's important to be conscious and critical of like Native people's own desire to perform being Native, you know? And not in a way to like criticize and be like, that's wrong, but just to be aware of that too. Or, like how that's been internalized uh, and to question that. Because again, it goes back to this idea of like, well, how could we be contemporary? And the reason that question is so important is because if we're understood as contemporary, then settler colonialism isn't over, it's ongoing. But if we're not understood as contemporary, then we can just forget about all this stuff and pretend like it's not still happening. Mm. When in fact, it's still happening. You know what I mean? So uh, I became curious about uh, what, how do you, in different um, like tribes and communities, how is your relationship? Do you like, um, is there kind of uh, fights or is there brother and sisterhood and uh, are you part of a bigger movement of native artists? Uh, well, something, that, something that happened in the 60s out of necessity is that there became this kind of like pan-native culture. So things like dream catchers, which are originally from our tribe, became this kind of universal thing. Or powwows, which are from specific tribes, became kind of like every tribe did it. And it was because like so much of the culture was suppressed that people needed to kind of like glob on in numbers in some kind of way to create this like identifiable culture. But in reality, like North American tribes, it's like much more similar to some place like Europe where it's like the tribe to the left of us or the west of us is the Lakotas and to the east of us are the Mohawks. And there's similarities in those cultures, but they're very different. Our tribe's known as like the kind of hippie tribe. Mm -hmm. Like we kind of trip out in the woods and stuff. Wow. And the Mohawks and Lakotas are like, Kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's perfect here in Sweden. You can sit and talk shit about all the other tribes. No, no Well, also, like, our tribe was also, like, the weakest tribe in terms of settler colonialism. Like, we adapted the best at it. Whereas, like, the Mohawks and Lakotas are, like, fought really, really intensely. But they also, like, tried to kick our ass all the time, too. And we mm. just, like, kind of went off into the woods. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, but, yeah, it's, like, I think it's important to think of different tribes in North America as nations, because it's also this idea of sovereignty, and that's the only way we can have rights. But it's also complicated because we derive our sovereignty from the federal government that's colonizing us, you know what I mean? So there's this idea about the politics of refusal, like how could you refuse uh, identifying underneath the umbrella of someone who's trying to control you? Or like how to exist outside of that? becomes really complicated because like if I renounce my tribal citizenship because my tribal citizenship is derived from the authority the federal government gives my tribe, then I'm no longer native. You know what I mean? So it's like this really twisted catch-22. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Um, so this is a quite big question, but who do you think has the right to portrait minorities and indigenous people? 
I think everyone could do it, but you really need to do it with respect and to find out. Uh, you can't just, I think you have to do really good research and be part of at least the community somehow, uh, even if you're not maybe, li I don't live in the summer culture, but I don't think I, I can't, I, I, I think I can do things anyway. If I, yeah, I, I, I think you need both perspectives, like both from the outside and inside, and, uh, but you can't continue to produce these stereotypes, and uh, it's so complicated, I think. Uh, and when you talk about this and all fights, it's the same in the Sami culture. It's like this, I'm so still happy that Sami blood is on on screens because it's from the south, um, because you already took all the Sami language away once, and now you know it's no one who can tell that story if you don't. What I mean is, uh, it, it, I don't know if the the writers still have the fight about it, but it's. If you can't do a film, uh, a Sami film, uh, because you can't speak Sami language, then I think it's fucked up totally. Because we have already been taking away the, the, the language once. Should we do it once again? It's a, such a strange thing. Uh, so, uh, When Anna says south, she means uh, pr uh, the Sud Sami, because the Sami, like in Northern America, here the Sami is not one homogenic group. There are several different languages that are very different from each other and the um, South Sami language is one of the mo is at the tipping point of extinction and it's also a smaller group than the Northern Sami group, correct me. If I'm, but so um, of course the perspective of the southerns uh, of the southern sami sud sami scan is always like a little more marginalized and um, since uh, most speakers uh, there is a like ongoing revitalization but most speakers are very old and many it's also they don't live in the same place so it's very complicated because they're spread around but this question of language is very present here because here in for example if Swedish television shows um, uh, or makes they have like uh, Swedish television needs to make a certain amount of Sami hours every year a certain amount of Finnish in, in and in every language and but as Anna touched uh, there has been a strong process to kind of erase our languages. Uh, so many of us, or some of us, have lost our language. And uh, then when, I mean, to preserve the languages, we need to make film in the languages, but we can, but the thing Anna is addressing is that we can't like, we need to be able to tell minorities from uh, stories with, in Swedish, but also in the minority language, but some, how um, um, that can become a problem since then we lose so many stories uh, that need to be told because so many of the younger generations can't speak it. So that's, uh, I don't know if you have that issue at all or if your language, original languages are still present. Uh, present but scarce and it's a super big issue in terms of maintaining the language and revitalizing it. And invoking it in films, like that's the reason we picked that title. And in the film, there's a lot of Anishinaabe Moen, which is the Ojibwe language, embedded in it. Because also, like, I think it's important to also realize that the language represents a philosophy, like a way of thinking, and that part of accessing the culture has to be understood through that language. Because I don't know, it's complicated, but I think yeah. there's an element to it. Yeah, and also if you do stereotypes, I. I my work is on stereotypes somehow, but to discuss it. And then it's also complicated because a lot of Sami people don't even want to touch on stereotypes. They hate these dolls and they hate these postcards and they hate it. But still, I think you have to discuss it somehow because it's a reproduction that kind of still is ongoing all the time. Well, also the deconstructed then too. You're going back to the, who has yeah. the right to yeah. make what? It's something I struggle with and think about a lot. 
there's like a slogan in North America, nothing about us without us, mm. which I think is pretty good golden rule. I think I'll just give an anecdote. Like you all know about Standing Rock. It was like, Standing Rock. Okay, mm -hmm. so there's like 20 really shitty documentaries that came out about Standing Rock, yeah. all done by like white activists, and it's like you know like the water guns are out, and everyone's like ah, and like doesn't really get to any of the issues, which are about sovereignty and maintaining sovereignty and resistance against the settler colonial nation. But it was like me and like nine other native filmmakers were all approached by each of these 20 projects to come on board as a producer, like right before they picture locked. And we're like, no way, you know what I mean? Like, and that's what I mean about nothing about us without us. It's like, to do that at that point is like disingenuous. Uh, and then really thinking about the importance of community, especially within these stories, and the level of engagement from the beginning, as opposed to tacking on at the end, I think is really key. But the other thing that I keep running up against is I didn't get into film or art to tell people what to do. And I actually like film and art when it's transgressive in that way. Uh, and kind of just does whatever the fuck it wants to do. So there's like a weird tension around that where I don't think there should be someone who says you can do this and you can't do that. But there's also like ethics involved that do have to be considered. But it's messy and murky and strange. But I think also a big thing too is about like if someone's making a film about a community that they don't exist in, to be really honest about what their desire is to do that and be really clear about that, not only with the community, but with themselves. Because I feel like that's where things get tripped up a lot, is people aren't even honest with themselves what they desire from, from making this film or making this project. And that's when it gets really messy, I feel like. And one last thing, there's a really great short political zine called Accomplices, Not Allies. I don't know if allyship is big here, as like kind of activist lingo. No. No? Or allyship. Alliance, I guess. Yeah. Like people are like, who aren't part of the group that's being oppressed, but they're like, I'm an ally for these people. Uh, and this is this kind of like pedantic essay that argues that allyship isn't good enough, that what we actually need is accomplices. Accomplice is someone who helps another commit a crime. So the idea that any decolonial act is inherently criminal. So that to actually like put, put one's neck on the line for the other is much more important than saying, I'm standing behind your back. Uh, or like, yeah, offering up one's desire to be a part of a political movement in a way where it's not just like a Facebook post, but it's like actually going out onto the front line. Uh, it's just something to consider. And I feel like it gets to that idea of, about like being clear about what's, what one's desire is to be a part of a movement. But um, when you uh, make your films and make your interviews and stuff, what, how do you feel uh, when you made this movie? Um, these people and in these interviews, how do you, f how do you think uh, the closeness and the, uh, your interview persons? Uh, it's kind of a leading question, but. Um, you can probably come quite a bit closer. Um. Well, yeah, I think one of the other kind of guiding principles that me and my brother have kind of developed in terms of like how to make work about our own communities or other indigenous communities. So there's always this talk about like resource extraction, like Standing Rock, like, like pipelines, or like, like putting a nuclear power plant near, next to a reservation. And this is like a really important political issue, but I also think that there's like knowledge extraction which is just as relevant, maybe not as relevant, but like it's, it's along the same lines. Of what like, do you mean with knowledge? It's knowledge extraction is like people coming in from outside and wanting something, yeah. like a piece of knowledge or some kind of spiritual information, you know, wanting to come in, take it, and then like publish it in a book or like make their movie about it, mm -hmm. where it's like, it's extractions, taking, taking away and not adding anything to. Um, so me and my brother are really conscious about that when we're doing interviews. So we're not asking pointed questions to get sound bites. Like for a not to say, we did like 48 interviews and the shortest one was two hours long, which is like sucked for editing, but it was like really important for us in terms of a mode of working. And all, the only question we ever asked was like, do you know about the seven fires prophecy? And older people from where I'm from love to talk. There's this cliche of like the stoic Indian who doesn't talk, but that's just because they're uncomfortable. 
but it was like a chill environment. I was like, yeah. you know, Pauline, could you introduce yourself? And she's like, my great grandfather was so and so. <laughs> and then, like, 60 minutes later, she's like, oh, yeah, by the way, my name's Pauline. <laughs> but, like, if we were a traditional doc film crew, we'd be like, oh, no, 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 just could you state your name and what you do? Mm. You know, and cut, cut them off in that way. Yeah. We're here, just like, just let it ride. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sit, sit with it. And whatever the person wants to give you is what's meant to be there. Mm. I like that way of uh, thinking. I don't, I, ha I don't have a clock. What's the time? Oh, there's five minutes left. So um, time flies by. Uh, does the audience have any questions? Not everyone at once. Yeah, I have tons of questions. I'm just trying to find a way to formulate them. So the okay, we we'll wait for you. <laughs> Anyone else? I have a question. Um, to you, um, Anna, what made you actually, because I, I skipped on the first five minutes, what, what made you actually explore the Islamic culture? What made you go there? Because I'm raised in a... Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, she, she, she asked what, she missed the first part of the seminar and asked uh, what made Anna to want to address those issues or touch it. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of born in that um, hardcore bullying about Sami people in my, my um, hometown and in my class and all the people and I always felt in between because I was part of it and I was not part of it. I still don't know if I'm in or out, but um, because my I was so close to my grandfather, and he really, really struggled for being, you know, he talked always good about the Sami people, and also my father, father's friends, Sami friends, and, and I just heard all these stories about the bad and the rich Samis, and they took all our countries, and they take all our land, and we can't hunt anymore, and blah, 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 blah. And somehow I wanted to look on the on that um, um, idea of what a Sami can be, and my way to do it is to look on the the exotism and the tourist attraction, and to to look on it from another way. Because I'm not in the Sami culture really, so it's not my way of telling a, a story around it. So it's more, a, a, I think, I try to be in the more political and the colonization of the north and how that looks. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, you touched about it a little bit, but uh, as far as the, the films that you said come out a little bit in Sweden, uh, in, I guess, the US primarily, like, are they, do you think that they're like very one sided, that it's the same thing coming out over and over again that portrays you as people, or and how would you maybe like to change that? Uh, I'll just repeat the question, and uh, if the films that come out are have a certain used to be in a certain way, and how do you wanna, how, yeah, work with that? Yeah, there's tons of cliches when it comes to native cinema, and a lot of the times it's mostly non-natives doing it, but also some native filmmakers doing it too. So like me and my brother's running joke is that like. There were so many times we could have put powwow or drum music in our movie, yeah. and like all the well-intentioned white people would like shed a single tear, you know. <laughs> but it's like you can't do that; you have to like resist that urge. Yeah. Uh, and then also just like the trope of victimization. So like the stories are always like poor, downtrodden natives, as opposed to like anything else. Uh, so I think those are like the cliches or the tropes that we're trying to push against, not to ignore those things and not to not address those things but not to only focus on that. Because I also think uh, it's very easy that it always becomes political. You know, like I'm thinking of this Taika Waititi kind of tried to address these indigenous people, not just from a political standpoint. How do you stand for that, for movies coming out more, maybe just portraying the lives, not having to be political and still be enjoyable and accurate? I'm all for it, but I like politics. I think it's yeah. important. Especially because I think the biggest thing that we're thinking about when making work is like how to make settler, colonial, settler colonialism legible as an ongoing project, sure. which I think is just like a political, political thing to do. But I hear you, and I think it's also like refreshing and exciting. Like I have two friends who are awesome First Nation filmmakers who are making rom-coms, 
you know, and it's like speaking to like a whole different kind of like existence or presence. Yeah. Yeah, no, I only thought about um, what you said about Sami and queer, and that you would address that. I just wondered, like, what you would have yeah. said about that. Yeah, I'll just repeat the question. She was thinking about Sami and queer, and how, in what ways, you addressed that. Um, in the program I curated? No, I think more in general, that because we never, time ran out, but we were supposed to talk about also kind of links and similarities between um, the queer community and Sami community. So maybe you just... Yeah, it was an uh, idea of showing a, a piece from my um, sperm whore, my film called Sperma Hora, about queer families. So it's maybe the, <laughs> the thing you, yeah. you mentioned. Yeah, but I think also it's not so much, but if you know anything about it, it's like uh, the Queering Sakmi project, you can check it up. Uh, it's a nice project about um, queers in that culture, and also there is some films, not many, but some. Yes, time's over. <laughs> yeah, you go to see Adam's uh, screening tomorrow. It's a funny one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You will laugh. Yeah, thanks, Anna and Adam and the Film Institute and Anna Uppsala Kortlius Festival. This was really funny to talk. <laughs>